Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the new year. My name is Richard. So if you've seen our previous videos, you know that the VW ID4 electric family car we've tested a few times, and I rather like it. I think it's a very comfortable, practical, spacious car. This here, though, is the VW ID5 GTX. <laughs> And the front end may look like the ID4, but as you come towards the rear, you'll see this coupe-like sloping roof line and a very attractive rear end. This being a GTX, it's now four-wheel drive and we've got more power as well. 0 to 6 in about six seconds as a result of about 295 brake horsepower equivalent. So it's a bit more perky than an ID4. Maybe it's a bit more compromised because of the shape here, but I think it's a very attractive car. Anyway, what we're doing in this video, one of my first jobs of the new year here in January, is to drive this car back to our showroom. So I'm going to get about 50 miles to give it a bit of a real world test. So not just uh, what I think of it to drive, it'd be interesting to compare it to the likes of the Tesla Model Y, a Hyundai Ionic 5, for example. Uh, but we'll also reset the trips, get a gauge of the real world efficiency, work out what its real world range capabilities are. Uh, what the running costs would be, and exactly what we think of the VW ID5. Right, we're back at base now, and I want to start here by just talking about running costs per mile. And I'll do that before we talk about what the car's like to drive. Uh, because uh, we still see a lot of stories in the news and the media that uh, electric cars cost more to run now than petrol and diesel because electric's more expensive. So let me give you some numbers. Right, so we covered just over 50 miles to get back here and we averaged 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour. So what does that translate to in terms of money? Well, that's about 9.7 pence per mile. Now, if you have a diesel and the current average price of diesel is £1.88 per litre, then you would need to do 87 miles per gallon to match the cost per mile of fuel running this. And that's assuming the highest UK domestic rate of 34 pence per kilowatt hour. If you have solar or if you have a cheap overnight charging tariff, which a lot of electric vehicles would have, uh, vehicle owners would have, then it would be far less than that. So I'm taking kind of worst case domestic charging scenario. I do agree that when you uh, do a long trip and you might need to do public charging, they're more expensive. That would be a closer gap there. Uh, but normally you would charge from home and you can see there are still significant cost savings in your running costs. And most people will just charge at home and do all the school runs and commutes to work and that kind of thing. If you're gonna run your car as a company owned vehicle, there's huge savings to be had when it comes to benefit and kind tax. If you have a diesel TIG one, you might pay a couple hundred pounds a month in tax. Uh, but if something like this, and it's electric, it's much lower, something like 30 pounds a month probably. So big savings to be had even so. So what does the real world range work out to? Well, I'm a bit average 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour in today's conditions, which is quite breezy today. It was 11 degrees, it's been damp, not exactly ideal. Although we drove mainly on A roads, which is kind of 50 miles an hour. So that then is fairly efficient. Uh, but it would work out with 77 kilowatt hours of usable battery from an 82 kilowatt hour pack, a 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour gives you very nearly 270 miles of real world range. Not trying, keep up with traffic, not trying hard and then, you know, climate control on, music on, all that kind of stuff, real world driving. So that's pretty good, isn't it? And there's still big savings to be had when it comes to running costs per mile. So how does it drive? Well, I think really quite pleasant. Let me just pick out a couple of things as I kind of go through them in my head. I think it's got more road noise from these big 21 inch alloy wheels than the standard ID4s that I've driven before. The smaller alloys, they were very, very quiet cars on the motorway. This has got no kind of wind noise, but you do hear more tire roar. It's not bad at all, like it's a nice quiet car, but it's just a more than the ID4, I'm sure, from what I remember of one of those. Now, as I just go down the country road in the comfort settings here, it's quite reasonable indeed. It does have that pick up and pull that you don't get with the normal ID4s that are just rear wheel drive. And of course the extra traction of four wheel drive I've got here now as well. And you do find that the numbers on paper, so about six seconds, to 60, you know, for the GTX, I guess it'd be nice to see that being a bit quicker really, but let's get this in context, six seconds for a spacious family car. It's a, it's a quick car and it's got the punch. And what it does have, which is quite interesting, is if you kind of give it a bit of beans around the corner, it's actually the rear wheel drop, the rear wheels kind of, it feels like the rear motor's the more dominant. So 
it is a little bit more playful on the rear end than something like a Model Y, which just very efficiently gets up and goes. This one actually, if you put your foot down in the, in the, in the wet on the corner, you can actually kind of move the back end around. Like, don't get me wrong, it's not a drift monster, but it just has that little bit of kind of body movement on, on the throttle, which you don't get with um, really most cars, to be honest. A Honda Ionic 5 does if you push that a little bit, actually. So it's got this nice balance about it where you can switch it into comfort. It's a smooth, quiet family car. And then you can go to some of the sports settings, firm up the steering, sharpen the throttle, sharpen the dampers. And that does give you that sportier edge, albeit not as fast as some cars these days, but in context, come on, six seconds to 60 isn't bad at all. There's a couple of little things that do bug me a little bit. Uh, which aren't ideal. One is the haptic buttons on the steering wheel. I'm not a big fan of them. I think VW actually said with the launch of the ID7 that they're going to be starting to remove haptic buttons more, which would be quite a good thing really because you do just press them by mistake and you turn the volume up by mistake and all that kind of stuff. The other one is that the uh, kind of lane assist function is always on uh, every time you get in it. So I can get in the car now, turn it off, uh, but it will be on again next time I drive it. And that's only really a problem on country roads like we've been driving on today. And it's quite common with a country road in the UK that it's narrow, you might go towards the centre line or even cross the centre line quite safely, just as part of driving down a windy country road. And every time you do that, it bings at you, it shows me the head-up display, and it can even sort of tug the car in if, you know, if, it, uh, if it wants to. And that's kind of annoying. And does it tug the car in? It does, like that, look, it's just pulling that in. I don't really want to, I want to be over there so I can see around the corner better. So I'd rather that, you know, people say, that, well, that's a regulation, that's a European regulation thing. Well, in a Tesla, you can have the on, you can turn it off, and it stays off. So I'd kind of like to see that in this. So the option is to just always have that off, because on certain roads, it is a bit interfering. So it's another day, it's a bit brighter, and the car's a lot cleaner. So let's have a look around it and show you the ID5 GTX in a bit more detail. Dynamic cornering, matrix, LED headlights, and these are excellent. So good, they actually corner, these little bits here like eyes, they look around and actually corner, but then you've got the dynamic matrix function, so full beam but shadowing that car in front. And the headlights on this, much like the uh, dynamic headlights on the ID3 and the ID4 are brilliant, excellent, some of the best out there. And just like the ID4, there's nothing under the bonnet here for storage. There's a load of other stuff, but there's no storage. It'd be good just to have a little tray in here, even just for one or two of your cable sets could go in here, but there's nothing there that you can use. These are the upgraded 21 inch wheels. They're staggered, different size front to back, 235, 45, R21, and the back, I'll put down text here. Uh, even on these big wheels though, it does ride nicely, it's comfortable, and it does have adjustable dampers, but I'll come onto that in a bit. So along the side there, it's like ID4, but then when we come back, we've got this sloping roof line, and then round to the back section. Again, from this angle, I really like the look of the back of this. I think it's great. And again, some nice LED lights at the back, which also have kind of animations when it's locking and unlocking. So I like that, and I like the look of it overall. It really is quite reasonable, in my opinion. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Parking sensors down the bottom, of course, reversing camera. Now, what I would say is uh, the boot opens from here, but there's no, not much back bumper, if you know what I mean. So yes, there's a bit of bumper here, but I think if you were to back up to a post or something, you'd very easily be damaging the tailgate. Same can be said of the Model Y, though, to be fair. However, let's open up the boot here, and we know the ID4 is massive. Uh, this one, again, very, very big. So a big, large, practical area, a huge parcel shelf. So maybe a different solution for that might be good, because that is rather large, but I'll probably just take that out and get rid of it. 12 volt socket there, some storage down the side. And the floor here, you've got a storage underneath, or you can actually remove this floor and put it lower down to make the boot a bit deeper. But in its higher setting, it makes a very nearly flat low lip there. Easy to get things in and out. And it's got a three-way folding seat at the back there as well. No, it doesn't. It's got two-way folding seat and a ski hatch. Sorry. I like little details like this, to be fair. Where if you've got a carrier bag, rather than it tipping around in the boot, you can just hook it over here. So nice little practical touches like that, I do like. And you can tell VW have been doing this for a while because they've even got this little rubbery bit on the back of the tailgate here. So when this closes down, it actually kind of clamps down the t uh, parcel shelf and stops it rattling. What can I tell you about the inside? Well, again, remember some specs and trims may vary, of course, but this one here certainly has a lovely, it's got fabric seats and so not all leather, but I do like this material with this red stitch in here. I like it. Nice. I like armrests, very good. The seats are very comfortable. Keyless entry, keyless start, no problem. It's got all that. Uh, very VW, so if you've seen the ID4 and the ID3s, it's very much the same as that. It's got a larger screen in this one here, 
and this one also has the head-up display. So head-up display being something you can't get with the Model Y, um, but it also has manual seat adjustment, whereas Model Ys would always have electric. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, comfortable seats when you get in the right place, that's all good. Uh, typical VW ID3, ID4, ID5, steering wheel with the haptic buttons that are quite easy to press by mistake. But it's nicely finished, nicely trimmed. We've got a wireless Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and the screen's nice and colourful. It's easy enough to use. It's quite a simple software, so again, compared to something like a, a Tesla, it's not as dynamic, not as slick, and not quite as functional. But it does the job, and being able to use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto means you can use Google Maps, Apple Maps, Waze, whatever you like. So that works well. Normal air vents that you can push around just easily like that, that's fine. So nice ambient lighting, all quite practical, all quite functional, and I quite like it. Big glass roof in this one with a sunshade you can pull over. And this is nice, you can appreciate it more from the back, these glass roofs. Uh, do you know what this is for? Well, if you fold the seats down, there's actually, uh, this car at least has it, uh, a load net. So you can fold the seats and attach a load net up here. And if the seats are upright like this, you can also attach the load net to some similar anchor points there, like a dog net. So it seems to come with that, a standard. We've got Isofix in the back, and there's also Isofix in this front seat, by the way. So there's three Isofix. What we do have in the back here, which a Tesla Model Y doesn't have, is separate climate controls. So that's nice. There's two USB ports down there as well. And have a look, look, tons of space, tons of knee room, tons of leg room. Comfortable seat, plenty of headroom. Despite the sloping roof line, it slopes back behind me. So in the back here, I'm very comfortable. You've got an armrest here with a couple of drinks holders, and then you've got the ski hatch there if you need to put some skis through. I suppose Joe hasn't stuck his head out of there. That's what he normally does. I can't see him at the moment. What you can do like you can in the Model Y is actually adjust the angle of the backrest here. So they are in that fixed position. And the other thing I'd like to see is, although we've got a pocket in the back of the seat here, I guess it'd be kind of nice to have a pocket a bit higher up. So again, with kids in the back, they can put their sort of phones and iPads and such like in it uh, a bit easier. So even if they're in a child seat, they could reach it. It's comfortable and I could be in here for ages. I probably will be unless you let me out of this door because the child locks on. In your driving mode, you've got eco, comfort, sport, traction, individual. In individual, you can adjust your dampers here from comfortable to more sporty. Now, when you're driving along, you switch between these modes. You can feel the difference, and it's good to have adaptive dampers. I like that. Um, but it's not night and day. It's still got spring suspension. Although it makes a difference, I'd have trouble figuring out the 15 different levels of comfort to sport settings on here. So I think you should just have, like two or three, to be honest. But nonetheless, it's got adaptive dampers and Ionic 5 and Tesla Model Ys don't have that stuff. So good to see it on here and it does make a difference. I like it. On the GTX, you do get lane assist and radar cruise. So you get a radar on this, you don't get radars in Tesla's now, do you? Oh, cameras. So yeah, I mean, you get used to this, don't you? It, uh, for me, it's, it works. It is a little bit laggy at times, but I've not had any problems with it as such. Um, it just isn't quite as slick and nice. See, it's a bit delayed there, isn't it? So the software doesn't seem problematic like some of the earlier ID3s had, but it's just not quite as sharp as some of them. But I prefer the look and feel of this to the Hyundai, for example, uh, but not as good as a Tesla, of yeah, course. Sure. There's no sentry mode. There's no kind of, um, you know, a, a built-in dash cam filming in case of an accident sort of stuff you get with Teslas now. There's no dog mode really, although you can lock the car without the interior alarm and you can let the climate run for a bit, but it's not got like a dog mode that's easy to enable again like Tesla's. So it's pros and cons, but I do like the look and feel of it in here. It's smart and simple and comfortable and I do like having an armrest, so I find it nice and easy to drive. These glossy bits that people put around here, manufacturers and the doors and on here, these always end up, if not scratched, just full of fingerprint. I guess the sensor storage isn't as big and spacious as the Y, is it? Because it's got a couple of cup holders here and the phone holder, but one phone holder and a much smaller compartment than you get with a Model Y, for example. Uh, Ionic 5, you've got the big bit down the, in the middle there, and you can move that console around to open the front up. I quite like that. What I found with a couple of cars is not enough left foot room, but this car is fine, so I'm happy with that. Plenty of left foot room, I'm not going to moan about that. So there we go, the inside of the ID5. Some nice touches, some nice details, some pros and cons compared to others. So there we have it, the ID5 GTX. And you know what, I do like it. I think it's a nice package, nice and practical, some really nice design features and things like the reflective windscreen to reflect the heat, good headlights, head up display, some nice touches inside, very spacious and practical. Is it better than a Model Y? Is it better than a Hyundai Ionic 5? Well, really it's down to 
your priorities and preferences. If you like the look of this, I think it's certainly worth giving one a good try. The Tesla always has the advantage of supercharging network, of course, it's just more comprehensive and easier. But this has got some really good qualities about it, and I do really like it. It's probably more comfortable with better ride and adjustable dampers and such like, uh, but it's gonna be down to what your preferences are. Horses for courses, as you say. So there we have it, the ID5 GTX. I hope it's been a useful video and we'll see you in the next one. Hey everyone, thanks for watching our videos. If you like our content and want to see more, don't forget to not only subscribe, but also hit the bell icon for notifications so you don't miss any new videos as they're uploaded. Plus, we're also on Instagram. Just look up R Simons or RSEV. Us, we're on Facebook and Twitter. So lots of news, stories, and things as we go on each one of those channels.